Hi, I'm Dr. Holly Miller, and I'd like to welcome you to the HIMSS podcast on meaningful use, the basics, how and why. We're going to cover the United States healthcare crisis and the need for healthcare transformation in our country, how health information technology can and will play a role in that healthcare transformation, and then talk about the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and how dollars have been put aside to incent physicians to adopt electronic medical records as long as they are using them meaningfully. We're then going to talk about various considerations about how you will achieve meaningful use in your practice. In 1999, the Institute of Medicine published the now famous report to Air is Human. This report highlighted that medical errors are the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. These errors cost approximately $40 billion per year. In addition to the costs of medical errors, healthcare costs in general in the United States are skyrocketing. Currently, they represent about 18% of the gross domestic product. This is predicted by 2020 to be 21% of the gross domestic product. And what this means is currently 18 cents of every dollar is spent on healthcare in the United States. In addition, for the same goods and services for healthcare in the United States, we pay far more than every other developed nation. So identical goods and services, far more cost in our country. We would hope that this would represent superior quality of medicine and outcomes, but in fact, this just has not been the case with many reports pointing out that the United States lags other developed nations in healthcare quality and outcomes. In fact, in the United States, we have a lower life expectancy than 21 other countries. We are also experiencing an epidemic of preventable diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. These conditions are in large part created by our behaviors, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, and eating fast or junk food. The costs of medicine in the United States we've already talked about being so high. Well, this is only going to become worse because of the aging trends. In 1998, there were about 40 million Medicare beneficiaries. By 2025, there will be nearly 70 million Medicare beneficiaries. So why do we need health information technology? What role does health information technology play? Well, health information technology appropriately implemented will support healthcare transformation. It's not in and of itself the answer, but it's a tool to achieve healthcare transformation, to help us achieve healthcare transformation. Health information technology can decrease medical errors through appropriate clinical decision support. It will support the consistency of care across patient care transformations. So in other words, if a patient goes from the hospital back to home, they may be given different and new medications and be unsure of if they need to continue the medications that their primary care physician gave them before they went into the hospital, or if they need to continue the medications that they were given in the hospital. Health information technology appropriately applied will help the providers be aware of what each other are doing get critical information to all caregivers at the right place at the right time when the patient needs to be cared for. In addition, health information technology appropriately applied will help to support care discrepancies so that there is equivalent care given regardless of socioeconomic status or of race, which have been issues in our country. We believe that health information technology will also improve consumer engagement or, or patient engagement in their health and therefore improve compliance and, and uh, outcomes. And finally, we think that this, there will be a great improvement in population health. Despite all these benefits, there's been low adoption of health information technology of electronic health records. In 2008, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study which demonstrated only 4% of physicians in the United States were using fully functional electronic medical records, and 13% had basic systems. 
This also demonstrated the fact that the adopters of electronic health records were largely in academic medical centers or integrated delivery networks, not small practices where actually most of care is delivered in our country. Once again, health information technology in the US lags behind other developed nations or many other developed nations. The barriers to the adoption of electronic health records have been well documented. The primary barrier cited by most clinicians is the cost of the systems. Other barriers include the fact that the implementation of electronic health record is really not just the addition of a new tool into the practice, it is and it represents a total practice transformation. And so this does involve a great deal of thought and appropriate change management with the implementation of the project. Now, change management includes a consideration of the end user's, the answer to the end user's question, what's in it for me, or what we call in, in the jargon, the WIFM. And so, these are systems that are costing the provider money, that are difficult to learn to use, or in many cases, take some time to learn to use, and require a practice transformation. So often providers have been left asking themselves, what is in it for me? Well, this is the answer that Aura represents, that finally we can provide the incentive for a physician to adopt an electronic health record. In 2009, the president signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This authorized between 36 to 44 billion dollars for Medicare and Medicaid health information technology adoption incentives. In June of 2009, the first meaningful use matrix was published and a period followed for which it allowed uh, providers and clinicians to be able to respond to this published document. The interim final rule was published in December of 2009, and this provided a period of feedback from the medical community. At the present time, we're awaiting the meaningful use final rule. ARA also enabled other initiatives to encourage, it was a multifactorial approach, it encouraged other initiatives as well, or supported other initiatives that would encourage health information technology adoption. These included the regional extension centers, the NHIN Direct, and Beacon Grants. And I don't have time in the scope of this presentation to go into these, but you might want to look those up as well. There has been extensive feedback provided relative to the interim final rule. And in fact, just a few days ago, May 3rd, 2010, 51 very significant healthcare associations sent a seven-page letter to Secretary Sebelius. Quote, as a coalition of groups from across the healthcare spectrum who have each submitted our specific comments about the rule, we share several common views on the proposed rule, including the need for greater flexibility and meaningful use, more time to achieve meaningful use, small physician practice representation on the Health IT Policy Committee, a feedback loop on program performance, a focus on clinical functions, a less restrictive definition of a hospital, less burdensome reporting requirements, greater attention to operational issues, and harmonizing the Medicaid and Medicare health EHR incentive programs. Hopefully, these comments will be considered by the ONC as we're awaiting the final rule. So the Medicare and Medicaid incentive programs have been designed in a three-stage effort. The interim final rule that's been published only refers to stage one, and this would be starting in 2011. The focus for this has been on e-prescribing, lab results into electronic health records, and clinical summaries being able to be sent to providers and patients, public health reporting and quality reporting. Stage two is as yet to be defined as is stage three. Stage two would begin in 2013 and expands on stage one with patient personal health record access, e-prescribing refills, electronic record summary, receiving health alerts, immunization information, and immunization information. Stage three begins in 2015, expands on stage two, 
and is focused on accessing comprehensive patient data and automated real-time surveillance. Let's talk about some examples of the requirements in the interim final rule and what that might mean if you already have implemented an electronic health record. So let's take a very simple one. For eligible providers, when seeing a patient, the electronic health record must be able to record demographics, including preferred language, insurance type, gender, race, ethnicity, and date of birth. Now, I'm sure many of you that have implemented an electronic health record have many of these elements already available as discrete data elements that can be pulled from and reported from your system, such as gender, date of birth. But what if the system does not record preferred language as a discrete data element, or race or ethnicity as a discrete data element? Well, what this would mean is that your vendor will have to go back and do some coding to ensure that these now can be recorded as discrete data elements and be reportable from your system. This will require you to implement an upgrade of the system in plenty of time to train and retrain your staff in order to be able to ensure that you are meeting the percentage required for these data elements and have the opportunity to achieve meaningful use. So step one might be that the vendor is doing the coding, has a new release available, you upgrade to that release, you train and retrain train or retrain your staff, ensure that the workflow is correct, do some reporting to make sure that the staff is appropriately achieving the goal for meaningful use, and then might need to retrain them once again if they are not achieving that goal. Now for this element, so far in the interim final rule, they're requesting that 80% of all unique patients seen by the eligible provider have the demographics as described, recorded as structured data. Let's take another example. Incorporate clinical lab test results into the electronic health record as structured data. Now for an implemented electronic health record inside an integrated delivery network or an academic medical center where it is very likely that the patient would be having the lab test done in the same facility so that this would merely require a single interface to that lab system that's part of the information technology system throughout the facility. This is a simpler process then, for example, for a small physician practice where the patient might go to multiple lab facilities to get the lab test done. So the patient might go to one of three or four facilities. Either this would require the practice to have an interface to all of those facilities so that the data would come back into the electronic health record or structured data, or alternatively, that the clinician or someone on the clinician staff would need to enter that data as structured data into the electronic health record system when it returned. Clearly, this would be something quite different depending on the practice and the health information technology situation for the practice. We do see that the requirement in terms of percentages were lower than for the other example we mentioned, that this requirement was 50%. But many practices still might feel that that is high and onerous. Let's talk about the components of what it will take for a system to achieve meaningful use. Well, first of all, the system must be certified. It must be adequately used or meaningfully used. And then ultimately, that will need to be reported on by the, the clinician will need to pull reports from their electronic health record to submit them to prove that they are meaningfully using the system. Now we talked about the different stages of meaningful use. Stage one, which is the stage that is in the process of being defined. Stage two, which is to be defined. And stage three, which is also to be defined. And they all build on each other. In order to achieve payments, the clinician would need to be meaningfully using the system by 2011 or 2012 at the latest for stage one. For stage two, that starts in 2013, 
And for stage three, that starts in 2015. You can achieve meaningful use in 2011 or 2012 for stage one. The difference being that in 2011, you can attest that you are meaningfully using the system, but by 2012, you must submit reports that demonstrate that you are meaningfully using the system. So what is the financial reimbursement for achieving meaningful use at the various stages? Well, if you achieve meaningful use from 2011 or 2012 and beyond, so stage one, stage two, stage three, the maximum dollars for Medicare that you would receive is $44,000 per eligible provider. If you achieve meaningful use not until 2013 at stage two, the maximum dollars that you would receive per eligible provider for Medicare is $39,000. And if you achieve by 2014, it drops to $24,000. If you achieve in 2015 or beyond, there is no payment and there may well be penalties. So really, it's not become a question of if a clinician is going to use an electronic health record. It's really the, the environment that is trying to be created is that this is necessary for healthcare transformation and it's not a question of if but it's a question of when and it's a question of getting it done. So let's talk a little bit about an eligible provider. Well for Medicare an eligible provider is defined as a an MD, a DO, a dental surgeon, a doctor of dental medicine, a podiatrist, an optometrist, or a chiropractor. For the Medicaid incentives it's defined as physician, pediatrician, dentist, certified nurse midwife, nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant operating in a federally qualified health care center or rural health center. Let's talk about how in your practice you would achieve meaningful use. Well, let's separate practitioners into those that have already implemented an electronic health record and those that have not yet implemented an electronic health record. If you have not yet implemented an electronic health record, I would suggest that you include meaningful use as part of your overall implementation plan right now, starting out. Where are you in your implementation cycle? Are you selecting a vendor? If that's the case, then I would strongly suggest you are in looking at the vendors and, and questioning them about are they certified and what is their plan to have their customers achieve meaningful use. If you're already developing your project plan and you've selected a vendor, once again, talk to them about their plans for achieving meaningful use. It's very important to consider that most vendors, once the final rule is determined, will have to go back and do some coding to make sure that their systems will achieve meaningful use. So at some point, you'll either be implementing, if you're brand new, EMR, and the version that will have all of the functionality to ensure meaningful use, or you will implement ahead of time and then be upgrading to that version. If your implementation is already in process, this is something that you might consider as a major enhancement as part of the project. And so it, it sort of puts you halfway between and betwixt a new EMR implementation and an established electronic health record implementation. In all cases, Wherever you are in your plan, meaningful use must be incorporated and consideration must be given. If you, um, we've talked about change management and the importance of change management in an implementation plan. Well, clearly, in terms of change management, you finally have a great WIFM to provide to the end user. It is a financial incentive. So this is really the, the gist of what the purpose was, and, and uh, this is very important. On the slides that we've included in this set, we've listed several HIMSS resources and other resources that are available for more information about meaningful use and some of the other topics that we've touched on. Finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and wish you good luck in achieving meaningful use for all of your projects. Thank you.